it is one of those stories that uh, Islamophobes and non-Muslims, they love to bring up uh, against our Prophet Sallallahu and that is the assassination of Salam ibn Abil Huqayq. Salam ibn Abil Huqayq. Now, uh, Salam ibn Abil Huqayq, so we've already talked in detail about the assassination of who in the past? Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf. We had an entire session on Ka'ab and I encourage all of you to go back to that session, it's online, and listen to uh, how I presented it and how I think it's really not that big of an issue. Really, I don't see it that big of an issue. Uh, and Salam is basically similar in this regard. It's also an assassination uh, in this regard. Uh, or, uh, you know, we can call it a targeted killing as is the modern terminology, right? We can call it like this, okay? This is not collateral damage. This is uh, uh, targeted, if you like, extrajudicial, if you like, killing. It is now common. No, as I said, in modern times, nobody has a right to open a peep anymore. After all that has happened in the last, you know, 10 years, khalas, this is now standard warfare. Well, we don't know the exact date, uh, but clearly it happened after Ahzab and before Khaybar. After Ahzab and before Khaybar, most likely sometime around here, the 6th AH. And Salam ibn Abil Huqayq was one of the rich leaders of Khaybar. So Khaybar has not yet taken place. Khaybar is another major battle we'll talk about in 3-4 weeks inshallah. Khaybar is going to come. The big battle of Khaybar is going to come. Salam is one of the big shots of Khaybar. And Salam had been one of the main financiers of the battle of Khandaq, the battle of Ahzab which just took place five months ago, right? Salam, being this wealthy billionaire, if you like, he has financed the tribe of Ghatafan. Now go back, rewind. Remember, the bulk of the fighters of uh, the Ahzab were basically hired mercenaries. Remember that, right? The bulk of the people were hired mercenaries. They are not interested in an actual fight of paganism versus Islam. They just want their money and their supplies and whatnot, and that's it. And that is why when the weather turned bad and when Allah sent His punishment, the first people to run away were the hired mercenaries. They're not there out of a genuine desire, right? Who paid for these mercenaries? Number one on the list, Salam. Okay, so Salam has to be eliminated. Because he done it before, he's going to do it again. And also a message has got to be sent. You're not going to get away with this. Anybody else who wants to think about this, the message has to be sent. And so, a number of people of the Khazraj, they themselves came up with the idea. The Prophet ﷺ did not tell them, go kill Salam. Because this is a very dangerous expedition. They're going to have to go to enemy territory. Khaybar is... Uh, far distance away, at least two and a half, three days camping uh, by, by traveling. And Khaybar is fortified. Every single mini tribe has a massive fortress, right? And we had already said that the Yehud had developed this architecture and the Muslims really had not developed it. They didn't know how to do it. And the Yehud had thick fortified walls that Muslims had not yet learned how to conquer. They didn't have the machinery, they didn't have the weapons to conquer, and we will see when the Battle of Khaybut takes place, this was the biggest problem. The Prophet stood there, or not stood there, but camped there for a month in Khaybar, not knowing what to do, because it's just very difficult. Even in Banu Nadir, he had to camp outside. In Banu Qaynuqa, there were always issues, because the architecture, the fortresses, there were massive thick walls, and they were basically structured in a way that the Arabs on their horses and camels could not really attack them. So this is, is going to be a secret expedition, where it's not going to be massive, it's going to be a small group that manages to pinpoint Salam and then eliminate him, right? And that's why, of course, in modern terminology, some have called this an assassination. Whatever you want to call it, it's something extrajudicial killing. It's something that was common back in then. And frankly, it has been resurrected in our times as well. And so the Khazraj volunteered. Question, why would the Khazraj volunteer with this idea? Where would they come up with this? Why, why are they so interested in, in doing this scheme? Response, they felt that the Aus had beaten them by taking care of Ka'b ibn Ashraf. And they felt that the Aus have 1-0, the score is 1-0. And so they wanted to do something that shows that the Khazraj were just as dedicated. The Khazraj were just as warrior, just as brave. They could also take on challenges. And they took on a challenge three days away. Unlike Ka'b who was one hour away. Right? The Khazraj said, we're going to outdo this. And we're going to do this and we're going to get rid of Salam ibn Abil Huqayq. And so uh, the Prophet sallallahu gave them permission to do so. But the only thing he said, make sure you do not kill any woman or children. 
This is not something that I'm going to allow you to do. You want to kill Ka'ab, you want to kill, sorry, Salam, but don't kill any women or children. Now, by the way, footnote here. So in those days, there was no such thing as civilians versus military, civilian versus army. Every adult male was the army, right? Every adult male, there is no, there is no army that is basically conscript, uh, conscripted army. Everybody who's a fighting age will fight. That's the way it was. So, you know, when we hear these hadith and we say, well, how about non-fighting men? Back then, there was really no such thing. Every military or every man of age was a military man, right? And this is the, the you know, the, the, this is the case still in some countries and it was the case back in the days of the Prophet. So, so when he's telling them, don't kill women and children, it's not too much of a stretch to say, don't kill civilians in our times. Right? We take the, the goal, the principles of the Sharia, ah, extrapolate into our times. It's, it's really what the, the goal or the maqsad of the Sharia ah is. Don't kill those who have nothing to do with this. Right? You want to kill Salam, he's caused us harm. He has, he has, you know, number one financier of the entire expedition. Okay, get rid of him. But don't kill any women or children. So, five people volunteered from the Khazraj and their leader was Abdullah ibn Atiq. Abdullah ibn At Atiq with a kaf, not a qaf. Abdullah ibn Atiq. And uh, Abdullah bin Atik uh, was chosen because he could speak fluently uh, the language of the people of Khaybar. Most likely this language was Hebraic, Hebrew-Arabic. Most likely it was a mixture, neither pure Hebrew nor Arabic, that the, the, these tribes had developed their own language. And because he is a Yathribite in the good old days, uh, Abdullah bin Atik, I mean, and because he's been raised amongst the, the people, so he spoke their language like a native person. He spoke it fluently. And this is, if you're going to do this type of attempt, you're going to have to, you're not going to be stuttering in Arabic when everybody in the fortress speaks, you know, fluent uh, Hebraic. So uh, he, volunteer, he volunteered along with uh, four other of the Sahaba, and they immediately made their way to Khaybar, uh, and they camped outside wondering how they're going to get in, what is it going to be the strategy to get in, and Abdullah ibn Atiq said, I have an idea. Leave it to me. And so, uh, this, the way that it was in the past, in fact, up until recently, in all Muslim cities and non-Muslim cities up until recently, they would always shut the doors at Maghrib time. Right? All the doors of the city are shut. Anybody wants to come in after that, they'll have to wait till the morning, when you can see. And so he waited, 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 until it was right Maghrib time. And he then made his way to the visual distance of the guard, so that the guard could see, and he pretended that he is basically urinating, that he is somebody, you know, urinating and, and, and you know, relieving himself, right? And the guard shutting the door, and he sees in the figure somebody urinating in the distance. Now, obviously, you're not going to think this is a spy. This is like, come on, hurry up before the gate gets closed. And that's exactly what the guard said. I'm going to close the gates, hurry up. And so, he quickly rushed in, and the gate shut behind him, individually. And... When night, he must have hidden somewhere, we, again the details are scant, uh, he must have hidden somewhere. When nightfall came, he then went back to the gate, opened it up, allowed the rest of them to come back in. Right? So now they have the five people in the fortress, in the walls, and they find their way to the house of uh, Salam. And uh, Allah knows how they did this. Again, these are, this, the details are not mentioned, but one would assume that the, the structure of the inside of the fortress was such that the richest person or the noble person has the central and the largest. However it was, they found their way there and uh, they made their way into the house and eventually they assassinated or they, or they killed him or they, they exterminated him, whatever word you want to use, they got rid of him. And his wife uh, saw them, she set out an alarm, she cr cried as loud as she could. One of them, one of the Sahaba was about to basically kill her in order to stop the cry, but then he remembered, what did the Prophet say? No women, no children. So he sheathed the sword back and the five of them uh, fled. On the way out, uh, so the room of uh, Salam was protected in that it was on a ladder that was leading in to a higher room. So he had a way out. You had to climb up something to get to his top room, if you like. He was on the third floor, second floor. So Ibn Atik, the leader, was. Uh, it is said that he had feeble eyes. And when they were racing outwards, he slipped. He didn't see the step. And in the process, he sprained or he broke his foot. We don't know whether he sprained or broke. He basically, he could not walk. So the other Sahaba had to carry him outside. And then they had to rush back to Medina while the uh, cry is being given in the city. That must have been a very harrowing experience. We don't have details other than this. But subhanAllah, your imagination can really get involved here now. That one of them is crippled. The four of them are, are now the cry is being given. She's yelling and screaming. Allah knows yani, how they did it. But 
they escaped without a single casualty other than his broken or sprained foot. And when they came back to the Prophet ﷺ, uh, the Prophet ﷺ told him to stretch his foot out and he rubbed his hand on the foot and of course, lo and behold, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the foot becomes uh, perfectly healed. Now, obviously, I encourage you to go back to Kaab ibn Ashraf's story for all of the disclaimers, but just in a nutshell, um, frankly, those were different times, there were different norms, there's a state of war going on. The main point really is, this was expected, this was understood, this is a part of the territory back then. We just talked about Abu Sufyan trying to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. It's a two-way street. This is the way the world worked back then. Nobody is saying that any Muslim can just start doing this himself anywhere they are. No scholar in the history of Islam ever says this, right? Can a Khalifa use such a tactic in our times, well, let's talk about this when we have a Khalifa, right? And then we'll worry about what is this allowed, what is not allowed. And frankly, there are people like yani Sheikh Al-Qardawi and many others who have basically extrapolated entire volumes about modern nation-state rulings, modern jihad rulings, and they have all said, look, the Sharia is a platform, it is a spectrum that allows you for modifications, it allows you for some changes, and if there are customs in place, if there is a United Nations treaty in place, if there is a type of other protocol in place, the Sharia allows us to adapt to that protocol. And if, for example, once upon a time before our own country opened this door, 10 years ago let's say, once upon a time this type of extrajudicial killing was considered to be illegal, it was considered to be not allowed. Okay, if theoretically there were to be an Islamic caliphate, it's not a problem for them to sign on and say, you know what, khalas, we will also consider this to be uh, not allowed. Now, we don't even know, it's up in the air. As we speak, there are drones taking place here and there and here and there and you know, there's going to be targeted surgical strikes on this and that. This is, well, this is now an ex accepted norm. So for anybody to criticize something that took place 14 centuries ago, we're going to tell this person, look, get relevant, get pertinent, deal with your own case that you're doing right now before you start criticizing something that took place 14 centuries ago. Frankly, I don't find this issue to be problematic at all. Some people make a very big issue. I think this is, it is what it is. That's the way people operated. And uh, we have a number of incidents, Salam and uh, Kaab and others, that clearly uh, it was something that was a two-way street, as we said.